Hello. Welcome to another Your Story Hour program. I'm so glad you've joined us. That goes for me too, Aunt Carol. As usual, we're eager to present another exciting story to everyone listening in today. You know, Uncle Dan, I have a really good story all ready to tell. I don't doubt that for a second, Aunt Carol. You always have something interesting, exciting, adventuresome. <laughs> Speaking of adventuresome, yes. I think that might be the perfect word to describe the person in our story today. Well, come on now, Aunt Carol. Tell me, who is he? He? Now, Uncle Dan, did I say this adventuresome person was a he? <laughs> <laughs> I guess you didn't at that. Okay, then, who is she? Well, I thought you'd never ask. Ah, uh-huh. come on now. All right, the she is, um... The suspense is killing me, Aunt Carol. How about I just begin the story, and then you and all our audience will know. Okay, sounds good to me. What's the name of your story? I call it Dakota, Dakota Doctor, Doctor Lady. Lady. Our story begins on May 26th, 1854, on a farm located in southern Lower Michigan. That was the day little Helena Knopf was born and joined her expanding family, which would eventually include a total of 24 children. Ah, Mother, she's beautiful. Another little scholar for the Knopf family. My dear husband, please allow our newest addition a few moments of childhood before you're ready to bundle her off to school. (laughs) I suppose you're right. But look at those bright eyes. She's going to be a handful. Well, then, she'll fit right into the family. (laughs) (laughs) And sure enough, when Helena reached the proper age, true to the Knopf tradition, off she went to school, full of curiosity and an eagerness to learn. Just a few years later, she graduated from the eighth grade and earned a teaching certificate. Soon she was conducting classes, and as was often the custom for teachers in those days, she boarded with the families of her students. (sighs) Well, there. Breakfast is ready, I think. All done with your chores, Alex? Yes, Mother, but the chickens didn't want to go out into the snow. Oh, I don't wonder. Must be five below zero. Go let your father know we're ready to eat. Yes, ma'am. Ah, there you are, Miss Knopf. Did you sleep well? Very well, thank you. What can I do to help? Ouch! Oh, Oh, Mrs. Smith, you've burned yourself. Here, let me get this cloth wet. Now give me your hand. There. Mm. Mm. Maybe it's a good thing there was ice on the bucket this morning. The cold water will help. It should reduce the pain. Oh, well, it does feel a little better. Now you hold that cloth on while I get another. Mm -hmm. All right, now give me that one and let's put this one on. There. Oh, Helena, my dear, you are a wonder. Why, you ought to be a doctor. I'll let you in on a little secret, Mrs. Smith. That's exactly what I intend to be. What? A doctor. Really? But you're a... A woman. Mm -hmm, Yes. Mm. And a teacher. How would you ever I've always wanted to be a doctor, Mrs. Smith. And so I've been saving part of my salary ever since I started teaching. It has taken me a while, to be sure, since I earn only $13 a month. But when I've saved enough, I'm going to apply to the university. In 1880, when Helena was 26 years old, she did in fact enroll in the University of Michigan School of Medicine. Three years later, in 1883, she and 16 other women graduated in a class of 177 students. Those had been wonderful years of study, but sad years as well, since both of her parents had died during this same time. Ten of her brothers and sisters had then moved to Dakota Territory, and Helena decided to head west to join them in the adventure. She rented living space in Jamestown, a community of about 1,000 people, which boasted 21 saloons and three churches. She opened up business as a doctor and kept her horses at the town's Capitol Hotel livery stable. One day, as she skidded to a stop at the stable and hopped down from her buggy, Harness off. Oh. Good lady here. Let me help with that. Oh. <laughs> Quite a spirited pair they are. Oh, settle down, you two. Beautiful sorrels, but a little on the wild side, aren't they? Oh, well, that's the way I like them. I broke them myself, you know. 
I plead guilty to watching you do that very thing. You watched me. It's not often a teamster and livery man such as myself gets to watch a lady such as yourself break a team of horses. Such as their rascally selves? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, hush now. I guess I just didn't drive them hard enough today to tire them out. But who knows, they may get another run before midnight. Tell you what, you let me get them settled and fed, and you go get yourself a little rest. I know what you've been up to, you know. You do? Everybody in town knows Miss Knauf, uh, Dr. Knauf. You've been out across the prairie again, nursing a whole family of sick children. Typhoid? Flu. Oh, well... You've been gone for two days now, and I'll wager that you didn't get a wink of sleep the entire time. Well, I... I, I thought I, as much. Uh, now you go on. Now, now, don't even think of unhitching your buggy. Let me. I'm perfectly able to... I know you can do it, but this time you're going to let me do it for you. But I... Oh, very well. I'm much obliged, Mr... Mr... Matthias Wink, at your service, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Wink. Matthias. Thank you, Matthias. I'll take good care of them for you. I know, otherwise I wouldn't let you touch them. Well, well. I see you have Dr. Knauf sorrels in your care and keeping, Matthias. What a woman, Josh. Did you ever see anything like her? What's this? Why, I believe I see... What is it? Admiration? <laughs> devotion? Written all over your face, my friend. All of the above, I confess. She's a good woman. And smart. <laughs> and a wild driver. She almost ran over Timmy Sullivan a couple of days ago when she tore out of here. <laughs> well, I guess she's more intent on getting where she's going than on what's in her way while she's getting. <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> that I do. And for that matter, so does everybody else. <laughs> Why, when Dr. Knauf's buggy comes into sight, everybody scatters for cover. <laughs> One of these days, she's going to turn that buggy clean over on a corner or mow somebody down in the process. I doubt it. She may be a wild driver, but she's a horsewoman like none other. She'll do just fine. Just fine indeed. Helena had not been in Dakota Territory long before her fame had spread for miles around Jamestown. At first, folks had been skeptical of a woman doctor. In fact, no other woman practiced medicine within hundreds of miles. But it didn't take long before people learned that when no other doctor would venture out in the teeth of a blizzard, Dr. Knopf would immediately pack up supplies and off she'd go in buggy or sleigh to reach her patient. Occasionally, someone would accompany her on long, seemingly endless treks across the prairie to help keep her awake. One of those was Clara Stuff, who also lived for a time with Helena and served as her office girl. Clara, do you think you could stay in the office while I'm out today? Well. Actually, I may not be back until tomorrow. Yes, Dr. Knauf. I'll take any messages that come in while you're gone, so you'll know if any emergencies have arisen. And I was wondering... Yes? Well, it's this stack of statements. I, I know you don't have time to get them ready, but I'd be glad to do that while you're gone. But there seem to be some mistakes. Oh? Yes, like this one. It's for that family south of town, you know, where you stayed for several days. You charged them... Nothing? Uh, I charged them just what they could afford, Clara dear. They have ten children and hardly enough food to feed one of them. But he... Well, then how about this one? It's only half of what you normally charge. Well, let's see, who is it for? Here. Oh, yes. No problem. The statement is correct. But... No. No buts, Clara. I'm not here to strip the good folks of Jamestown of their very last cent. I'm here to help and bring comfort. If people can pay, I don't mind asking for some remuneration, but... Hmm. <laughs> now that I think about it, this bill should actually go in this stack. But you never send those statements out. They've been here since I came. What? <gasps> that can't be right. Hmm. You must be mistaken, my dear. Uh, I'm sure you know I'm not the one who is mistaken, Dr. Knopf. <laughs> <laughs> well then, we'll just have to wait to send them out until we decide who is right and who is wrong, won't we? In actual fact, many patients were never charged for services, and many bills that were sent out were never collected. Helena had not only learned the value of education from her family, 
but also the honor of selfless service, and her patients loved her for it. But her devoted patients weren't the only ones who found their admiration steadily growing. Oh, there you are, Matthias. Maybe you heard I have to be off quickly. I I'm... did hear, and I have your team ready. Your sleigh is out back. Here, let me carry that for you. Thank you. Oh, and could you please meet the stage for me, if it can get through? I have new supplies coming in, and I won't be here. Don't to... you worry about a thing, dear lady. I'll take care of it. And... Yes? I put a new buffalo robe in your sleigh. <laughs> it should help keep you warm. Matthias, thank you. Seems to me, Dr. Knauf, that you take care of everybody else. Maybe it's time someone took care of you. As you may have already guessed, Matthias Wink won Helena's heart, and they were married in 1886, just three years after she arrived in the Dakota Territory. He was a wonderful help to her, always making sure her equipment and horses were well cared for, and sometimes accompanying her on her long journeys as they fought their way through deep snow and howling winds. He was a picturesque character in his own right, especially in winter, wrapped as he would be in a great buffalo coat, felt boots, warm pants, mittens, and cap. A kind man who assisted his wife in every way possible. Still, due to circumstances, Dr. Helena Knopf Wink often traveled through challenging conditions alone. Dr. Wink, I just got word. What is it, John? A messenger just reached me a half hour ago from the from east of Alkali Lake. I know it well by spirithood. Y yes, I rode here as fast as I could. The family there, the mother, she's with child. And she's been sick for three or four days, and oh. now she's in labor. She's real bad. Can you go? Of course. But the storm. I've been in storms before, John, and my medicine bag is always packed. Uh, you best bring along food, too, Dr. Wink, like you often do. This family is poor, real mm. poor. And their house is more of a shed than a house with hardly a stick of furniture to call their own. I don't know how they even begin to stay warm. Well, then, my food basket, blankets... Medicine. How many children? Uh, three, I think. All right. I'll just leave a note for Matthias. He's on a run to Fort Totten. Gone to Spirit Lake. Now, John, let me get into my warm coat, and if you'll grab the food basket mm -hmm. and blankets, I'll get my buffalo robe. We'll be off to the stable. I'll take the sleigh. The storm isn't getting any better, Dr. Wink. You sure about this? The food basket, John, and hurry. I need to be on my way. After a grueling 15-mile drive through a wicked December storm, Dr. Wink arrived at the lonely shack of a house. Inside, she found the mother lying on hay in a wagon box which was on the floor. Through her skill and experience, Helena was not only able to save the life of both the mother and baby, she also baked bread, cleaned the cabin and cooked and cared for the entire family before heading home three days later. Another of her legendary adventures happened during the Great Blizzard of 1888. Helena struggled through deep snowdrifts, overturning her sleigh three times in the process, but finally making it through to the sod hut home of a family, all of whom were ill. She tenderly nursed her patients through three long blizzard-bound days. Take just a little sip. That's good. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Wink. She's going to be all right, isn't she? I'm glad to say that all of you are recovering nicely. As long as you'll see to it that she continues to take fluids, she should be fine. I just can't thank you enough. I don't know what to say. Without you, we... I found it! Your sleigh was completely buried by a big drift between here and the barn. I'm going to dig it out for you. <laughs> Well then, I guess it's a good thing that you got on your feet first. You've turned out to be my very best helper. If I put a pot of soup going over the fire, do you think you can take care of things after I go? Sure I can. Don't worry, Dr. Wink. Thanks to you, we're all going to be all right. Of course, not every patient could be saved. But it was well known that if anybody could pull a critical case through, it was Dr. Helena Wink. One of the most devastating situations, however, involved the Auguste Close family. The Close home served as a stopover station for travelers to Jamestown. Many travelers were given overnight accommodations. And one night... 
Yes? Hello? We hear you offer your home as a rest stop to travelers. That's right. Come in, won't you? Well, thank you. Uh, but first, do you have children? Yes. Nine, in fact. Why do you ask? We have only one, uh, but our child has taken very ill. Oh, the poor thing. I don't want to expose your children to anything, so uh, I think maybe we should just try traveling on. No, no, please. We have travelers through here all the time. Everyone is welcome. You sure? I, I wouldn't want oh, to... Oh, now, now. There's a room all ready for you. Tell your wife and child to come ahead. I see them in the buggy there. All right, then. Uh, and thank you. Just days later... Oh, Dr. Wink! Six of my children! Dead! Oh, my darling! I'm so sorry, Mrs. Close. I've done everything I can. It's diphtheria. Evidently, the child of your guest was ill with the disease. I and know! I... I know! Without you, the other three would have died. I'm sure of it. And maybe Mr. Close and myself as well, but oh, my children! My children! <laughs> In the days before antibiotics and when vaccinations were unavailable, sad scenes like this were not all that uncommon. However, Dr. Wink wasn't content to stand back when a chance of recovery was possible, even for illnesses generally considered to be hopeless. In those days, appendicitis, known at that time as inflammation of the bowels, was one such malady. And she's just burning up, Dr. Wink. Claire, of course, sent me to get you right away. The stuff house is about seven miles out, but I guess you know that since Claire's been your office helper and all. Yes, well, tell me again, Claire's sister Lizzie, how old is she? She's just nine. Her, her parents are wild with worry. They think it's inflammation of the bowels. She's in terrible pain, and she's been vomiting. We don't have a moment to lose, I'm afraid. Just tell me what I can do to help. Hitch up my buggy, then, if you would, the Surrey. Of course. Careful of the sorrels, they're high-spirited. I know! I'm going to have to bring Lizzie back here to my house. We don't have a hospital in Jamestown, so this will have to do. I'll be right there. All right! <laughs> oh, uh, let's put her on the back seat of the buggy. Oh, careful. Careful. There. <laughs> Now, Clara. Yes, Dr. Wink? You ride in back with your sister. It hurts so bad. Oh. She's going to need you to brace her. Try to protect her from the bumps as much as you can. And Mr. Stuff, you can ride up front with me. Helena drove as quickly, yet as carefully as she could, and arrived back home with her patient at about one o'clock. She immediately phoned Dr. Rankin, who also practiced medicine in Jamestown, and likewise sent for Dr. Branch and Dr. Moore, both physicians from the state hospital. By three o'clock, everyone was assembled, and Helena directed that Lizzie be placed on her dining room table for the surgery she intended to perform. Are you sure, Dr. Wink, that you want to attempt an appendectomy under these conditions? No such operation has been attempted anywhere in these parts. That's right, Dr. Rankin. In fact, very few have ever been performed in the entire United States. That's true, Dr. Moore. But if I don't perform this operation, Lizzie has no chance at all. She has a point, gentlemen. You all know that when we have a patient with inflammation of the bowels, it's just a waiting game until they die. So, Dr. Wink, tell us what we can do to help. And God willing, may you save this little girl's life. Dr. Wink proceeded with the surgery only to discover that Lizzie's appendix had ruptured. Fortunately, the infection hadn't had a chance to spread too widely, yet the situation was extremely grim. For the next three days and nights, Helena didn't leave her patient's side, even to change her clothes or to sleep. Happily, her skill and her attentions were rewarded, and one of the first appendectomy patients in the entire Midwest survived. Just a few weeks later, Jamestown's blacksmith, Philip Mason, fell ill with the same symptoms. It's inflammation of the bowels, isn't it, Dr. Wink? I'm afraid so. 
But as you may have heard, Lizzie's stuff is back on her feet again after surgery. Please, Dr. Wink. Operate on me, too. It's my only chance. And so Dr. Wink performed her second successful appendectomy. And while her desire to help others was an ever-present blessing, she was rewarded in her personal life as well. On March 2, 1891, Helena and Matthias welcomed their only child into the world, a son named Walter. Although the addition of a baby might have interfered with the profession of a less dedicated woman, Helena simply tucked her baby in a basket, which she put in her wagon by her feet, and continued to strike out across the prairie on house calls. By the time Walter was but a month old, he had already been on seven such excursions. And as a grown man, some of his fondest memories would be the wonderful boyhood trips he took beside his mother as she drove her team to visit housebound patients. Eventually, after the automobile became a more common conveyance, Helena's team of horses was replaced with a Model T Ford, which, it would soon be learned by everyone in town, was driven with the same wild abandon as her horses. Look out! Here she comes! And there she goes! <laughs> it's a good thing everybody knows to run for cover. You know what I heard? What? <laughs> well, I guess she's blasted through so many cross arms at the railroad crossings that the roundhouse has a fund to replace the ones she's destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't surprise me one little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Although her driving may have become legendary for less than admirable reasons, no one ever questioned the amazing, tireless, heroic actions by Dr. Wink to serve and save her patients. In time, she became known as Helena of Dakota. And when the flu epidemic ravaged the area in 1918, at the age of 64, Helena worked tirelessly to save those stricken, sleeping no more than three hours in a 24-hour day for months on end. During her 53 years as the Dakota doctor lady, Helena delivered 5,000 babies. And when any of them graduated from high school, she was on hand to honor their accomplishment by presenting them with a commemorative engraved silver spoon. In her later years, Still serving as the area's only woman doctor, she enjoyed her lovely home and her beloved hobby of gardening. She was a member of a number of prestigious organizations and associations and served in the capacity of medical examiner. Tragically, she died in February of 1936 at the age of 81 as a result of an accident in her home. Helena Knopf Wink was a woman who had definitely been ahead of her time. In an era when education was not considered necessary for girls, she became a doctor. Before Dakota Territory was divided into states, she was a pioneer on its vast frontier. And even now, at a time when much has changed, she's a lady who will be honored and remembered for many years to come as a valiant, selfless servant of mankind. <laughs>